so I'm uh, Nathaniel Hendren. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of economics at Harvard. And I uh, study a range of topics that are largely motivated by market frictions and the impact of those market frictions on a range of, of things, including uh, how we think about measuring the desirability of government policy that tries to correct those market frictions, and also in terms of thinking about new policies that can help overcome um, uh, different, uh, different frictions that uh, people might face. Uh, so to give some examples, some of my earlier work has studied the question of why uh, we don't see certain insurance markets in the world. So for example, people with pre-existing conditions are unable to purchase insurance in private markets. Insurance companies often turn them away because they have these observable characteristics. And on the one hand, you might just think, well, geez, that's just a, a natural thing. These guys are too expensive and they wouldn't be able to afford a policy. But what's uh, you know, not so clear is, well, why can't insurance companies just charge them higher prices? And so my, my work looked at you know, trying to identify what that friction is that is preventing those people from being able to purchase policies even at, at higher prices, for example. And what I identify is that people that have these uh, observably high risk characteristics have more knowledge than what the insurance company can ascertain about their risk. So for example, um, people that uh, have had a stroke have pretty good sense of whether or not they're uh, going to end up in a nursing home, or whether or not they're going to be able to, uh, say, live to age uh, 75. These kinds of um, subjective analyses that people are able to, to report are able to predict those outcomes for them uh, later in life. And it suggests that these frictions are really meaningful and would prevent insurance companies from offering these, these kinds of policies. And so that's sort of one example of how kind of market frictions can kind of enter into uh, an analysis and potentially motivate different government policies. Uh, some of my more recent work has started to think about the implications of these market frictions for the desirability of government intervention. And so here we want to think about measuring the, the value uh, of policies like things like the Affordable Care Act, things like expansions of Medicaid, other policies that have been oriented towards dealing with uh, imperfections in insurance markets, for example. And so thinking about the kind of uh, issues that arise when part of the kind of information that people have about those uh, events has been realized at the time you might try to measure uh, demand. You know, people have private information about whether or not the uh, about what their costs are to an insurance company. It introduces a lot of uh, problems for kind of canonical ways at which we try to measure uh, the demand for that insurance, which then is really important for understanding, geez, should the uh, government uh, think about uh, expanding the insurance market? We want to know demand if we want to think about the, the welfare impact of, uh, of, of policies like that. So that's sort of one branch of my work, thinking about market frictions in, in insurance markets. Another branch that focuses more on kind of different types of policies and different types of frictions that people face focuses a little bit more on a role of uh, intergenerational uh, policies and thinking about uh, bringing kids into uh, analyses of uh, uh, redistributive policies, of place-based policies, and other policy, uh, kind of common policies that get discussed. And so we've been, uh, in, a, in a lot of this, I've been working with uh, Raj Chetty to document variation in intergenerational mobility across the United States and show that a large fraction of these differences that we observe reflects the causal effect of growing up in different neighborhoods in the US. We just see an enormous amount of variation in the extent to which kids rise up out of poverty in the US. Um, and it looks like it's the causal effect uh, in large part of growing up in those neighborhoods. We think that if you had grown up in those, uh, in those neighborhoods, you would have uh, low outcomes as well. And so this is uh, stuff that we've documented using the identified data derived from the universe of income tax returns in the US that provides a uh, real comprehensive picture of both the outcomes of these kids, but also allows us to study uh, the impacts of kids that move across areas while they're growing up uh, and characterize their outcomes as adults later in life. And what we find is that the earlier you move to a better neighborhood, the better your kids do. And it looks to be about uh, linear uh, at the age of the kid at the time of the move, um, which suggests that uh, you know, neighborhoods matter, um, and they matter in proportion to exposure time. And I think uh, you know, as you talk to, to uh, any parent, this is, I think, underlying the logic of a lot of parents on where they choose to, uh, uh, choose to, to think about living, that the, uh, you know, giving your kids opportunities involves you know, giving them good environments to grow up. Um, and when we look at the data, uh, we see that that actually does matter when you look at uh, explaining variation across areas areas of the, the United States. Um, and so that's sort of a couple of areas where we've, we've focused on uh, in, our, in our past work. I think in terms of 
important issues that have not been addressed in, uh, in, in any of these literatures. I think the idea that place matters has generated a little bit of interest in thinking about place as a potential role for policy, but it introduces some significant challenges and some significant policy analyses that one would like to do. So for example, um, one thing one can do is uh, give families from, say, disadvantaged backgrounds the opportunity to move to better neighborhoods. This was something that was done as part of the Moving to Opportunity experiment, which uh, we've analyzed in our, in our work and find pretty large impacts on the young kids that were given this opportunity to move out of high poverty areas when they're, uh, they were growing up. But on the flip side, it's you know, another policy one can think of is to improve places. And the uh, difficulty with, you know, with uh, these types of policies, so an example here would be something like the Harlem Children's Zone. You know, we have these kind of two, uh, two examples of these kinds of policies, and there's other examples of these policies, but what's really difficult is thinking about the, the trade-offs between these, and I think one of the biggest debates that hopefully will be addressed, and I don't know if it will be resolved, but will be addressed over the coming 10 years, um, is this kind of classic debate between place-based policy of thinking about should we improve places, or versus choice-based policy, should you give families uh, uh, the opportunity to, better opportunities to move to better neighborhoods? Um, and then, uh, frankly, you know, as an economist, we should put the third option on the table, which is we maybe neither of these place-based policies play the role um, that they should. Maybe it's actually more efficient to do everything on a national scale using modifications to an income tax. I think all of these analyses right, will be uh, part of an agenda in the next uh, five to ten years to really understand the relative benefits and trade-offs of the different options options we have for uh, improving the uh, opportunities faced by low-income kids. I'd say one more thing in sort of the general approach to research. So one thing that um, I've tried to do in my research and uh, I'm get, that excites me about of a, lot of, uh, a lot of other research that I think is, is kind of beneficial out there is, is work that tries to integrate theory and empirics, that tries to write a model that doesn't make all that many assumptions but captures what you're interested in and you use it to motivate what you look at in the data. Um, I think some of the most inspiring um, analyses that are out there have components that you know, are giving you plausible identification in the data, but are also estimating things that you care about from a, a theoretical perspective. You think that that number you're estimating has some value beyond just the context in which you've estimated it. You think you're saying something in the context of something that you're, you're, you, you can bring to a, a, a broader question. And I think that's something that I hope to bring to the analyses that I conduct and that I would uh, provide as a, as a recommendation to, to young researchers. You know, if you're an empirical researcher, don't be afraid of the theory. If you're a theoretical person, don't be afraid of the empirics. Um, I think that there's always a, a, a nice synergy between the two, and I think some of the most inspiring work that I see out there is, is work that is integrating the two.